Welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. From the Popcorn Talk Network, the online broadcast network for movie talk, this is Historic Hollywood, spotlighting the most influential and founding members of Hollywood. Hello everyone on the internet and welcome to another edition of Historic Hollywood, a celebration of the cinema of yesteryear and the people who made it. Follow the network, we're on YouTube, youtube.com slash popcorn talk network, all over social media at the popcorn talk. I am Lex Michael, I'm all over the internet, my handle is at the Lex Michael and I am here with... Carrie Bible, my handle for Twitter is at Film Radar. Our co-host Byron Thompson is out today, unfortunately. Uh, our subject today is William Castle, a writer, director, producer, and above all, a showman who is perhaps perhaps best known for his use of uh, promotional and theatrical gimmicks that he would create in association with the motion pictures he produced to sell them to his audience. And we have with us to discuss the work of William Castle, a very special guest. He himself is a writer of just about every uh, form of literature you can think of. Novels, nonfiction, children's books, comics, screenplays. He's a director and he knew the man himself so to join us today to talk about William Castle and his work ladies and gentlemen please give it up for Mr. Don Glute. hello Don thank you good to be here and I'm not on Twitter <laughs> so uh, okay. so uh, unlike myself Don and unlike Carrie I'm I'm assuming you met William Castle yeah I met him the first time I met him a number of times I met him the first time though when I was living in Chicago I was a teenager and I got this letter out of the blue one day from the National William Castle Horror Advisory Board and Fan Club. <laughs> and it started out, this was in 1960, it started out Dear Fiend, so I, I knew this was for me. And according to this letter, they somehow found out, probably through a letter I'd written to Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine or something, that I was into horror films and monster movies and things. And they wanted me to start a local chapter of the fan club in Chicago and uh, it's sort of a paving the way um, for uh, Castle's new movie, which was 13 Ghosts. Uh, and I never started any kind of a fan club. But subsequent to this, I got another letter from uh, Columbia Pictures uh, inviting me to to attend a press conference. Castle was going to come to town, come to Chicago to promote 13 Goats. And that was a big deal for me because, first of all, I was my hobby then was making amateur movies. And to actually meet a real Hollywood producer, director, that was that was really in, uh, uh, an event I couldn't pass up. So we, we met down at the Chicago Theater, downtown Chicago, uh, and uh, Castle appeared, and the first thing, <laughs> the first thing that struck me was um, he resembled a local uh, auto dealer who did commercials on TV named Jim Moran. So I thought Jim Moran, the courtesy man, and I that I thought that's who he looked like. That's who he reminded me of. Sure, but he was this warm guy, uh, friendly guy, and we we were in the we were in a, like a conference room at the theater. And um, one of the first things he wanted to know was if we had seen the movie that was playing down the street, which was Albert Hitchcock's Psycho. And he wanted to know what we thought of Psycho. Of course, his next movie after 13 Ghosts was homici Homicidal, which was a Psycho-type movie. But um, he wanted to know if any of us would like to promote the movie. Uh, by, doing, by promoting it, he meant getting dressed up as ghosts <laughs> and getting on a float and going through the streets of Chicago while a record played with him. Uh, it was basically an audio version of, of the, the trailer just for the movie. I, it started off, you know, uh, do you believe in ghosts? I do, and you will too when you see my picture, 13 Ghosts. That's the way I, I heard that so many times I never forgot it. And um, so, of course, I wanted to, to do that. And uh, what the ghost outfits consisted of were sheets, of course, but they, there was a, a local magic shop in Chicago called the Treasure Chest, and they went and they bought a bunch of skull masks, and they ran out of skull masks, so they bought some clown masks, which they turned inside out, 
And I said, I'm not going to wear one of those things. That was the <laughs> lamest thing I ever... And I was making these amateur movies. Mm. And I was... Um, one of my role models at the time was Lon Chaney Sr., so I was doing all my own makeup. So I said to the guy who was representing Castle, I said, can I do a makeup? And he said, you think he can do it? And I said, yeah, there's a character in the movie called Dr. Zorba who was like this decomposing corpse type of thing. So I went, brought this little makeup kit down, which was in a fishing tackle box, went down to the restroom of the theater, made myself up as Dr. Zorba, and after... Um, the end of the first day it was all kind of melting off my face and everything so i said the next day i'm going to wear a mask but i'm not going to wear one of those skull masks or one of those dopey inside out clown masks sure so i had this what they were then calling a horror mask now it's called um, the monster collectors the shock monster but i had that mask it was it looked like a decomposing corpse and i wore that and um one of the things we did we we, we went to um different movie theaters that were going to run the film, department stores and things. We gave out these little cards. These Can we get a close-up of the card? Lucky Ghost cards, cards. And uh, I had, I saved a stack of these, and I've been selling, on, selling them on eBay for the last two or three years. Um, but we went through, we actually went through the Republican National Convention was when Nixon was running against Kennedy was, was being held in Chicago that year. So we went to the convention... <laughs> And the placard suddenly changed from Come Say 13 Ghosts to put a ghost in the White House. <laughs> and we went through there, and uh, of course we were all Chicago Democrats at the time, so we were, all, we were all there yelling and promoting Kennedy and saying Nixon, Nixon, and things like that. And uh, so that was a memorable thing for me. So uh, that's the first time I ever met William Castle. Sure, and that actually is a perfect example of the type of thing that we're referring to when we talk about these gimmicks that he would employ. One of the things that in looking at his body of work that I find the most fascinating and, and the most unique, certainly, uh, is for him, he would, he would put together these, these movies, and he was known primarily for making horror pictures. He would put together these movies, yes, with the intent of, uh, I believe his words were scaring the pants off of people. Um, but for him, the show wasn't limited to what was on the screen. He would try and create an experience using various techniques, both inside and, and you know, like you were saying, outside of the theater to enhance the experience, to draw his audience in more fully, more closely, have it uh, be more a uh, fully engaging, immersive experience than just sitting in a theater and looking at pictures on a wall. And by doing that, you know, he was one of the only directors or producers of that era, except for maybe Alfred Hitchcock, who people knew, who recognized, who knew him by name, they knew him by what he looked like. He was like a brand, if you will. Yeah, sure. Because he would appear in the films. At the beginning, he would say, well, I'm going I'm to show you how to work. The by the way, this is one of the um, ghost viewers from, from 13 Ghosts. If you were cool. uh, autographed by Castle, um, if you were afraid to look at the ghosts when they came up on the screen, you looked through the blue. And then if you weren't afraid, you looked through the red and you would see the ghosts. And I was not afraid. I, I looked to the red. But um, he would come out on the screen, and he would be sitting there in a chair, you know, with a cigarette cigarette holder, and he would show you how to work this. So he would explain, explain the gimmick. And um, so people knew who he was. He was sort of a celebrity within his own movies. Sure, uh, and for for those in our audience listening to the audio-only version of the show, the ghost viewer looks a little bit like picture... Oh, the uh, older 3D glasses with the one lens red, one lens blue, and it works similarly to those, except that you look with both eyes through one color. Right. And the problem was you could still see the ghosts even if you didn't. Apparently they, they were still viewable were, with the yeah. naked I, eye. I do want to put it into context that one of the reasons these, these tactics were all the more brilliant by Hitchcock and Castle, um, television had come in in the 1950s and people are staying home and they're not going to the movies as much. So sure. studios are trying stereo sound, 3D, biblical epics, cinemascope, all these things to put butts in seats. And when they did these kind of gimmicks, it worked, it got people out, it got people interested, it promised them an interactive, immersive, unique experience that they weren't gonna get at home. Sure, I mean, and it's it's fascinating that you put it exactly that way because you, theater owners are experiencing something very similar now where they're having as hard a time as they ever have getting people out to the theater. And it's like, we have so much uh, technology that's available to us at home. How do you create an experience that you cannot have anywhere but in the cinema. Maybe a good story might help. You that, would be, that would help. That'd be a nice start. <laughs> um, and so these ideas, this this inspiration to 
to make your experience, to make your story bigger than just what the audience sits down and buys their ticket to watch. We see examples of this from Castle going back quite some years before the horror pictures that he would eventually become known for. Uh, he, it's interesting to note, he was born uh, April 24th, 1914 in New York, New York, uh, but by age 11, he had lost both of his parents. Uh, he, I believe, lived after that with a sister, an older sister, for some time. Uh, at age 13, so the story goes, he saw the stage version of Dracula with Bela Lugosi, and he saw this over and over and over this production. He became so enamored of it. And he, I, I guess by virtue of just being there so much and being around and being so enthused and taken with it, uh, eventually Lugosi himself recommended young William for a, a job, a technical behind the scenes position in the touring company of that production, which of course was great practice and it was great immersion for him uh, that that he would learn from, he would take with him and he it would inform much of his later work, but there's a story that I, I want to say is maybe the first big example of him employing one of these gimmicks, and we were talking a little bit about it before we, we got on mic, and it's a story where uh, in the early 1940s, uh, Orson Welles is going off to make Citizen Kane, and William Castle gets in touch with Welles, and he rents the Stony Creek Theater from Welles while Welles goes off to make his movie. And uh, Carrie, uh, I want you, if you if you're able to, I want you to tell the story because you you lit up a little bit when we were discussing it before. So, do you want to? You tell it. I'll I'll interject. You sure? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the story, and like many stories, uh, like like many stories of the era, we we don't. Uh, some of it may be apocryphal, but I'm going to tell my favorite version of the story as as I know it. He hires this. German actress. German actress by the name of Ellen Schwanecke. And when he learned that under the the rules of the time, the theater guild regulations of the era, that uh, apparently German-born actors could only appear in plays originally performed in Germany? Yeah. Yeah. So. Which struck me as very restrictive. Um, he claimed that he had hired her for a play that at that point did not exist. A play called Das ist nicht für Kinder, which translates to not for children. Uh, now, at this point, the Nazis are in power in Germany, and they send an invitation to this actress to attend a premiere of a production in Munich. And Castle saw an opportunity, and he went for this opportunity that he saw. He seized it, and what he did is he published a note that he said was a refusal on behalf of his actress to attend this premiere that she had been invited to by the Nazis. Thus, she became known as the girl who said no to Hitler. And he sold his production that way. Now, of course, uh, Don, you mentioned it helps to start with a good story. The big irony here is that there was no play at this point. He didn't have a play to sell. So in 48 hours, he cobbled together this play, Not for Children, and sold it as starring the girl who said no to Hitler and went so far as to actually graffiti the outside of the theater with swastikas as another stunt to generate attention, to generate press, and it worked. And it was a successful production. And so a few years later, he took everything that he knew and he went to work at Columbia Pictures. And uh, Carrie, you mentioned uh, Harry Cohn, I believe. Harry Cohn actually liked Castle, and Harry Cohn did not like very many people. He was known for being a very autocratic dictator sort of guy, so for him to really embrace William Castle, which is Definitely something that you didn't see every day on the Columbia lot. Yeah, and Castle developed a reputation pretty quickly for being able to churn out these these B pictures, but on time and under budget. Which probably helped Harry Cohn to like him so much that I'm sure helped. Yeah, you're saving me money and you get your work done on time, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and some of those movies are pretty good. Yeah. Th those Whistler films, I wish somebody would put those out in a box set on DVD or something, uh, or Blu-ray. I mean, those are really nice, entertaining movies. They did some of the Crime Doctors, did a lot of Westerns, did a lot, of, did some 3D movies. So if you want to count that as a gimmick, he was doing gimmicks before he did the horror pictures. Sure. Yeah, and uh, also of note, in 1947, he was uh, an associate producer on Lady from Shanghai mm. with Wells. Um, and Rita Hayworth. And Rita Hayworth. In 1957, and this enters us into the era that we're going to be focusing on, uh, he decides to go off on his own. He's not satisfied with 
the the creative limitations imposed upon him by working within a studio he goes off and forms a production company with his associate rob white and they announced their intention to make five films over the following 16 months and the first of those was macabre and he mortgaged his house to finance this movie um but macabre is uh this this first one on his own right out of the gate is is one of i would say the more uh well-known or iconic gimmicks that he employed macabre was um you know uh you were insured he, he actually took out an insurance policy with lloyd's of london that if you died of fright in fact i still have my my policy is probably expired by now <laughs> and obviously since i'm sitting here i didn't cash in on this <laughs> but this is what it looked like this was the original um uh, macabre insurance policy and i don't know if anybody cashed in and it was only a thousand dollars so i if, if this is still good and i croak during the show or you know it, it's not going to buy me much, much of a a burial, but Not anyway, today, well. no. But this was um, this was this was a legitimate insurance policy. What is what is printed on the certificate there? On the back? Oh, on the on the front. Oh, on the front. Um, Macab, the producers of the film Macab undertake to pay the sum of one thousand dollars in the event of the death by fright of any <laughs> member of the audience during the performance. Beneficiary agreement in the event of. Of my decease by fright during the performance of the motion picture, yada, yada, yada. I understand that if I have a known heart... See, here's a catch. <laughs> I understand that if I have a known heart or nervous condition, the $1,000 is not payable. <laughs> so he, he had a loophole, even for that. Um, and that's this worked, too. And it, it also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he stationed nurses in the lobbies outside of the theater where they were exhibiting yeah, I don't remember I don't remember that in Chicago he, he may very well have done I've heard that. stories though about them doing that even in the early 30s yeah, for Dracula some Universal Frankenstein horror films so then that's a an old gimmick he probably uh, picked up on yeah but it, this these gimmicks work. work even even right away the first movie that he produced independently this tactic was proven successful the success of macabre was able to get his next film or based on the success of macabre he was able to get his next film financed and his next movie 1959 was house on haunted hill which is uh, a lot of it don you mentioned before we went on mike oh you know you talk about you know a lot of people said they were scared by movies and things well i i was never scared by horror pictures i mean to me they were like going to see a western or a comedy you went there to be entertained not 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 to be scared if i want to be scared i walked down an alley at night in chicago sure. you know uh, but uh, w w he actually had legitimate scares in his movies and in house on haunted hill you know even though the plot makes very little sense right when that woman appears when she when 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 the when the actress backs into the the character backs into that woman and she's got the eyes and she fills the whole screen now, i'm not talking about seeing this on television or on a dvd where the screen is you know that big and the room is lit. But when you saw that in the theater, that was a powerful thing. There were people running out of the auditorium into the lobby that, and, and not coming back. I mean, that was, a, that was a scary movie in its day. And I think anybody around my age, my age group, who saw that in the theater, it's like seeing Psycho in the theater for the first time. You know, sure. it's different than seeing it on television. And we were talking about earlier is about, to me, I think audiences today don't have that sense of wonder. I think today audiences, I'm speaking very generally, but they're so incredibly jaded and to me to be younger and or live in another time where you're easily frightened or you can easily be swept away by a scary movie i think there's something really sure. beautiful about that i agree with you completely i uh i mentioned to you before we got on mic that i revisited house on haunted hill and a, a couple other castles movies within the past week to prepare for the show and i found myself watching house on haunted hill hearing voices of people that I know that I could imagine sitting and watching the movie and going, this isn't scary, this is hokey, this is dumb, I don't like this. And thinking to myself, exactly what you're saying, we've gotten so cynical, we've gotten so jaded, we've, we've gotten so used to, as an audience, putting ourselves so outside the story that we're meant to be experiencing. Because if you put yourself in the shoes of any one of the characters in this movie and you try and experience the story from the point of view of the people in it, <laughs> It's legitimately terrifying, some of the things that are happening in this film. And to, uh, let's say, aid that sense of, of fright, of wonder, of expanding the story, the, the gimmick that was used for House on Haunted Hill in theaters was something called Emergo. And 
without giving too much away plot wise there's a sequence in the film that involves a skeleton that appears to be levitating entirely on its own so what they would do in theaters is a skeleton with red lights in its eye sockets would be hoisted up on a pulley system and would be floated above the audience in the theater when i saw that as a kid, as a kid you knew where the skeleton was going to appear because above you know hanging from the ceiling was this curtain thing that was you know hidden by a curtain so but the the brilliance of it was was they timed it so you see price on screen pulling the cords making the thing go up and down it, i mean that worked well it didn't look like a real skeleton and it got hit by a lot of paper clips and you know sure coke containers and things and i don't think um he never went to that extreme uh, you know uh, after that the funny thing is when i when i met castle Oh, when I met uh, when I met Castle at that press at that press conference. Yes, he said, "Would any of you like to have one of those skeletons or one of the the seat buzzers from the Tingler or any of those things? I'll send you one if you want." And we all the hands went up. You know, I'm still waiting for mine, so I, I don't have it. But um, that was um, he got a lot of mileage out of that, and um, you know, but, but I, it wasn't quite. As, I don't think it really came off exactly the way he had envisioned it, or the way we had, had envisioned it when we went to the theater. Sure, because it looked nothing like the skeleton that you later then see on the screen. <laughs> and I can imagine too. Once once people knew that it was coming and knew what it was that it was part of the show, like you say, like you've got. Oh, we were waiting for it. And we you, were waiting for it. And then you've got other objects flying at it, which I think might detract from the fright factor a little bit. Yeah, but it was uh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we talked a little bit, too, uh, before the show about how it, it does seem to be, among Castle's works, a lot of people's favorite. And I, I wonder if it's if it's because, uh, to me, it feels like a very, very accessible movie. Maybe, as you mentioned, every detail of the plot doesn't necessarily make cohesive, tight, logical sense. But there's something very, very uh, enveloping about the story. And it, it's very, very easy to get involved in what's happening to this group of people. Yeah, and I think also uh, he never equaled that shock scene with the woman in, the, in that chamber, that corridor, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call it, in House on Haunted Hill. There were scares and, you know, um, you know things come come out at you when you're not expecting it and you jump jump shots or whatever you want to call those sure in his later films like the tingler but they never quite had the impact but i think homicidal was probably his best of that group of films i mean that that movie really kind of holds up today uh, it, it's it, some people say it's as good as psycho well, and homicidal is interesting too, and we're we're jumping ahead a little bit. That's okay. Uh, the the gimmick associated with homicidal makes me laugh quite a bit. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it because, but the actress who played um, the character we're thinking about that I don't, I don't want to give away here, uh, and I well, I forgot her. I forgot her name, but she was the original um, Lily Munster, when, uh, named Phoebe, when uh -huh. they did the the pilot film for the the Munsters TV show, with a di slightly different cast, and she was in it playing a vampire type, a vira type of character, very slinky, you know, and, um, and and she's done quite a few other things. A lot of people don't realize that that she had a, a career beyond the Munsters and beyond um, Homicidal. Sure. Um so but that ending took me totally by surprise as a kid. And it took, I think, yeah. a lot of other people by surprise as well. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned The Tingler, which was the movie that he made after House on Haunted Hill. And Carrie, I know you especially were excited to talk mm -hmm. about The Tingler. There is so much going on in this movie that uh, in addition to the the gimmicks surrounding the theatrical experience, there, there's so much, and I revisited this movie again very recently as well, it struck me how much there is in the movie itself that is designed to work in conjunction with what was happening specifically in the theater. Um, so did you want to talk maybe a little bit about that particular gimmick? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, of course, the, there's a seat, I, just, I don't know how much to give away, but there's a scene where the tingler gets loose in the theater, and then Vincent Price is trying to track down the tingler in the theater, and there's a line that says, everybody scream, scream for your lives! And he's trying to get the audience to scream, but they're also trying to get the audience to scream in the actual theater, as well as the theater that's in the movie. There's so. the, the screen blacks out, and there's a Vincent Price voiceover, and you can hear the change, too, in the way the audio was recorded. You're not hearing 
uh, the character played by Vincent Price talking to the people in the room he's in, you're hearing Vincent Price talk to you, the audience in the theater, telling you to scream. And the reason we should we should tell our audience for those listening who maybe haven't seen the movie, uh, the Tingler, uh, the title of the film refers to this creature that all humans have at the base of their spine that reacts to fear and will essentially what is it a constriction that it does it's like well, a, it's like a, a mass that goes up your spine up to your you know skull and it looks like a giant black lobster basically <laughs> a little somewhere between a giant black lobster and a, a cockroach looking thing yeah yeah and apparently it is removable as as Vincent does in the movie during an autopsy which he has his autopsy lab in his house as as one does i assume and um yeah of course and it's i love vincent price so much so this movie was so much fun for me and what i really love about him is he's such a good actor that he can sell the most ridiculous pieces of dialogue yes. with utter conviction and i don't know that many people that could really pull that off you know it's just it's great to watch him in this movie and of course, being a silent movie geek myself, there's so many references to silent cinema, but of course, because they run the theater in the film and they're showing Tollable David, the famous silent movie, and then the guy's wife in the movie who's silent, she can't speak. So there's just right. a lot of stuff going on, you know, throughout this movie that's very interesting. It's also the maybe the first LSD movie. <laughs> so you want to uh... He takes LSD in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to sort of prompt the fear sensation right so he yeah. will have the tingler yeah and the the only way to stop a tingler in its tracks and dissolve it essentially is by screaming so that's why in the sequence towards the end of the film when the tingler is is loose not just in the fictional world of the movie but allegedly in in the cinema with you scream audiences because it's the only way you can stop your own tingler and he went a step further and it was i love i love the words that that he would make up for these gimmicks this one was called percepto and he purchased all of these military grade airplane wing de-icers that had these little vibrating motors and he would have crews outfit seats in the theater with these vibrating motors that were meant to be the tingler uh, cohabitating with you in the theater so you see the sequence towards the end of the movie and there are certain elements you know if you're if you're not watching it in a cinema You'll you'll get it, but it doesn't play the same when you're watching it at home. You don't have for you don't have, for example, a projection booth. Yeah, it's funny. You know, uh, I hadn't thought of this in years, but when I used to run 16 millimeter movies uh, in my house, uh, you would always, if you ever had a movie projector, you would always get dust in the gate. Sure. And you had to blow the dust out. You know, and then the dust would kind of wiggle around. So from the after we saw that movie, every time the dust would get in the, I would, I'd be running movies. Every time dust would get in the gate, we would, we would, somebody would yell, "The tingler's in the audience! The tingler's in the audience!" <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just very funny. I to hear me. every Halloween. Um, I haven't had a chance to go, but that the silent movie theater, aka Cena Family, on Fairfax in LA, they show the Tingler on Halloween, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to bring back some of the gimmicks. Well, you 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 read occasionally certain exhibitors will try and employ some of some of these gimmicks, but yeah, you don't. I feel like that is very much a lost art. And especially, especially now in a time where it is so difficult to get people to come to the theaters, I'm wondering why more people don't try and employ tactics like this. It could, it could happen. But then, <laughs> then I start thinking, like, what, what would a, what would a gimmick for David Fincher be? I feel like that'd be very unpleasant. <laughs> so they could ensure you, some of these movies. Now they could ensure your life. You know, if you die of boredom. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, let's see. So uh, we talked about 13 Ghosts, 1960, with the, the Illusiono process, with the filtering the ghosts in and out. Talked about homicidal. Uh, Mr. Sardonicus, 1961. Oh, Mr. Sardonicus had this card you got, which had a hand on it. It would be a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And Castle would appear on the screen, and he would say, you know, when we get to the ending, you're going to determine the ending of this movie. If there's enough thumbs up, he'll live. No, thumbs down, he'll die. And we got to that point in the movie, and then Castle appears on the screen, <laughs> and he starts counting them. Oh, oh, there's one in the back time. Oh, I almost missed that one, you know. 
you know, there was, of course, there was only one ending of the movie, but I would like to see that in some alternate world, the, 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 thing, the ending where he lives. Uh, so, and, but his, his, his gimmicks got less costly and less elaborate because that little card was just a little card. It wasn't a, a bunch of seats rigged to vibrate or a, a skeleton's going to fl- you know, float over the audience. Sure. Um, and I, I, yeah, that's, that's the thing to keep in mind is that I can't imagine that these, these gimmicks he employed were massively costly, but compounded over time, number of venues all across the country. That's, a, a, I would imagine, especially if you're hiring plants to scream, for example, you're buying airplane wing de-icers, even, even the pulley system to rig up, have people do that for the skeleton. It's, it's an expense for the studio. So yeah, we start to get to this point in his career where they, they uh, if, not, if not mandate, suggest firmly that he walk it back slightly. There was, uh, I believe when he did uh, Straight Jacket, the, the studio essentially said, please, no more of this. That's enough. And so he, he hired Joan Crawford as, as his star and would send her out on a promotional tour in lieu of something more flashy. As John Waters said, quote, Joan Crawford was the gimmick. <laughs> so, Fair yes. enough. John Waters, by the way, uh, a very avowed uh, devotee of William mm-hmm. Castle. Well, this this movie, uh, Straight Jacket, it came about two years after Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which really kind of proved a career renaissance for both Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. And it sort of started both of them on this new phase of their careers. Some people called it the Grand Guggenol, where they both kind of started appearing as horror figures. The, the grand dam of some ho- sort of horror, psychological terror type thing. Sure. And so Straight Jacket definitely falls into that. And also it kind of takes advantage of their, not only their star power, but their larger than life personalities and certainly their cult fan bases as well. And I did read that he um, had bloodied cardboard little axes he gave people. Uh, is I, that true? It could have been. I can't remember. I, I do know that in Homicidally, he had probably the cheapest gimmick of all. He had this thing in the lobby called the Coward's Corner. And you, would, <laughs> you get to the ending of the movie and he would say, if you're afraid to see the movie, go out to the Coward's Corner. Corner. I think you even got your money back. But none of us I, I believe gonna, you none of got us a refund. None of us that, you know. And I think some of the, some of the uh, people in the audience may have come to see the movie twice, you know, and that way they got their money back and saw the ending of the movie. They just stayed. In those days, you could stay in the theater and watch a movie until the theater closed. Sure. Just watch it over and over again. Yeah, I, I read the same thing about people going in more than once, and people would go in, watch the entire movie, go uh, sit through it a second time, come back out at the at the point where you were uh, given the option to do so, asking for a refund. And so eventually they just started printing up different yeah. color tickets. The for audience every had their own gimmick. <laughs> but the idea, the idea of a coward's corner where you have the option. You can get your money back if this is too scary for you, fine. But we're going, you're doing it in front of everybody, and you have have to wait over here where everyone can look at the people who are too afraid until the movie <laughs> ends. Uh, um, so uh, b- between Homicidal and Straight Jacket, there was a motion picture called Zots. And oh. you have with you... Yeah, we got these in the theater. There's these Zots coins. And I don't remember what what they did or what you... I, I, in the movie, they gave you some kind of magical powers or something. But I don't know what the purpose of... Uh, the audience getting things other than to get a souvenir of the movie or I don't think there was like any interactive kind of thing going on with Zots but uh, if we can see there's this little gold coin for those of you that uh, aren't watching that just uh, can hear us this coin with this symbol that I can't quite identify on it with a bunch of smaller symbols uh, engraved into it probably some Freemasonry symbolism in there somewhere yeah so these cool little coins that were given to each audience member that were uh, allegedly magic. That uh, I don't I don't know if yours has done anything. Man, does it teleport you or anything no, like that? No, it did a little magic for me because I <laughs> sold a bunch of these on eBay. So <laughs> put some dollars in my pocket. And the money buy plane tickets, teleport yourself that way. Um, there was a motion picture in 1965 called "I Saw What You Did," where he worked again with Joan Crawford, and they promoted it using these giant plastic telephones. But after a rash of prank phone calls and complaints, the Bell Telephone Company, which had a, a essentially a phone monopoly at that point, refused Castle permission to use them or even to mention telephones in the promotional campaign of this movie. So he decided, I'm going to 
scrap that. Okay, can't do that. I'm going to take the back section of theaters showing this movie. I'm going to turn them into what he called shock sections. Uh, and seat belts were installed in these chairs to keep patrons from being jolted <laughs> yeah, from their chairs. I don't remember that at all. That's fright. great. <laughs> Um, and then there was a motion picture in 1975 called Bug. And it, uh, again, not not the most elaborate or flashy or expensive of promotional gimmicks associated with Bug, but he did advertise a million-dollar life insurance policy for the film star Hercules, who was a cockroach. <laughs> you know, the last time I saw Castle in person was at a screening, a studio screening of Bug. And I had written a novel that had just come out maybe a year before called Bugged, B-U-G-G-E-D, exclamation point. And I thought he was, I went in there thinking he stole my story because the, <laughs> the title was so similar. And then I went up to him and I said, I was one of the kids on 13 Ghosts Float and all that, yada, yada, yada. And I said, I have a novel called Bugged. And he said, well, maybe we can make that as a sequel. But that was the last I ever heard <laughs> from or saw William Castle. Well, and that movie was made only a few short years before he passed away. Yeah. He passed, that was 1974. Five, and he passed away of a heart attack in 1977. When does Rosemary's Baby fit in there? So that was the next thing I wanted to hit. Rosemary's Baby was released in 1968. And oh, mm. and that so it fits in between a lot of these. There was a, a pretty considerable break, a 10-year break, in fact, between I Saw What You Did and Bug. Uh, I Saw What You Did was 65, Bug was 75. So uh, if I'm not mistaken... William Castle had purchased the rights to the Ira Levin novel, I believe, before it was even published. And he really wanted it to be, for him, a transition into A pictures. He's so like, I, I really enjoy the work that I've done, but I want to take a step up. And I, I can imagine he had, certainly he had he had fans, but there's a, you know, a certain level of quote-unquote prestige associated with, let's call it the next tier, if you will. So he brings it to Paramount. And Paramount says, hey, we love this. You're not directing it. And they gave it to Roman Polanski. So he produced the movie, and he has a cameo in the film, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. He's outside a phone booth while, while Mia Farrow's uh, very yeah, panicked Yeah, I on think you think it's Ralph Bellamy or something. I forget who the other actor was. And you see him, it's like he's listening to her make the phone call or something, the way I remember it. And then he turns around and it's William Castle. Is that... I, I believe that's that's correct. And so he produced the film, and he was hoping that... Uh, he could piggyback on the success of this a little bit because you know okay i wasn't able to direct this but this is this is an a picture this is very well received i brought it to the studio it's got my name on it but he wasn't wasn't really able to spin it into too much that was that much bigger um and right after it was released if i'm not mistaken he suffered kidney failure and by the time that he recovered the momentum whatever momentum there was from Rosemary's Baby for him personally had had more or less dissipated so that's why he ended up he went back and he made more well a another B movie which was Bug and then in 77 passed away uh, but his his career is so fascinating to me just because I think he yes he was a he was a writer a director a producer but he was first and foremost a showman just consummate showman in a way that we keep we keep reiterating uh you don't see you rarely saw it then you certainly don't see it now now i think most most studios idea of a gimmick is well let's let's post convert it to 3d and let's charge more for tickets and that to me is a shame because you can do so much more with the theatrical experience than just everybody mm -hmm. sit in this room even then the movie look i love movies as much as the next person but the experience doesn't have to stop on the screen. You know, yeah. I think the closest thing, I was just thinking about this to a modern day version of what William Castle did, would be about late 90s when the first Blair Witch movie came out. Because I remember walking down the street and seeing this filmmaker, student filmmakers lost, the, and it was like a real missing person sign. It yes. wasn't, and they had samples of the twigs, and it was like this investigation. From, I mean, it was like, me and some of my friends, we thought this was a legit thing. Like, hey, because I, I got out of film school around that time, and so we're like, oh my God, these young filmmakers, they like vanished, oh my, you know, and it was this big deal, and a lot of people believed it. And then when you see the movie, it's, well. And that you know. that type of viral marketing, I think, is the closest that that we've seen really since then to what Castle did. And yeah, the, the marketing campaign for Blair Witch Project is a is a particularly great example because if I if I remember correctly, in addition to what you're describing with the, you know, missing students, I believe nobody from the cast of that movie was allowed to do any press, was not allowed to talk to anybody because you really had to sell the illusion these are students that 
are gone. This is this is literally this is found footage. We found this in the woods, and we don't know what happened. I've got to gotta say, kids. I thought the movie was so disappointing. I remember walking out of the theater thinking, "Wow, the campaign was way better than the actual film." <laughs> but it did it. It it worked. It got me into the theater. I bought a ticket. I went to see it. So yeah, you know, another thing too is you know, it was always like you get something like this, and it's kind of cool walking away with something that's connected with the movie that you can take home sure but now it's merchandise yep you can get every every action figures and model kits and whatever every, everything under the sun which they didn't have back in those days sure so i think in some ways the merchandising has sort of replaced some of these gimmicks the, these types of gimmicks anyway yeah the last one that i really remember grabbing me was for the dark knight in 2008 there was a very big, very, very big, very popular viral marketing campaign associated with that movie. Much like, you know, you can't, everybody knows that Batman isn't real. I think everybody knows that Batman isn't real. So you can't necessarily sell it the way you could try and sell Blair Witch Project as a true story before people saw it. But there was a, a huge amount of both online and real world marketing gimmickry that was employed and talking about uh don being able to take something physical that you can walk away with i remember there were some showings of that movie uh where you could you would be handed and i have one somewhere and i don't know where it is but you'd be handed a, a replica of a newspaper from gotham city detailing you know from the from the world of the nolan movies so at that at that time so it'd be you know is is batman a, a savior or is he a menace who's who is he really and then stories about Har harvey dent our new da etc yeah, etc et I, I remember too uh, you know back in the Late 1950s, some of the movies like, um, and then into the early 60s, Frankenstein 1970, and then the Hammer film remake of The Phantom of the Opera, uh, First Men in the Moon. They gave you newspapers. They, sure. They were like, you know, four pages, you know, folded, uh, with uh, looking like newspapers. You know, The Phantom, what, who was The Phantom, yada, yada, what is Dr. Frankenstein doing? And um, and they just handed them out. They had stacks of these in the, in the lobby. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you don't you don't see that, and it's like you look at you look at how big when when these campaigns work, and it's telling that the two examples that we we in the more modern era or not let's say nineties forward, uh, being Blair Witch and The Dark Knight, those campaigns were wildly successful, and the movies were as well. So I'm wondering why uh, why you don't see any of that happening. And I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know that you have the immediate answer. I don't know how many studio heads either one of you can speak personally for, but I'm wondering why. Some, I think there's certain movies maybe that lend themselves more to a campaign of that nature than others. Oh sure, that could be part of it. Um, it could be that they, I don't know, studios are a lot more risk adverse today than Absolutely. they used to be because it used to be they make so many movies that you can kind of afford to you know, have some flops. But today when a studio is making what, eight to twelve movies a year, maybe, they have to hedge their bets. Sure. Sure. Um another one that just popped into my head that is we you mentioned Hitchcock a couple of times. Uh Psycho is an example of that type of marketing where if you I believe if you came in after the picture had started you wouldn't be admitted. Psycho is, is, is like a, a pivotal point in movie viewing history. Because when I was a kid, you went to the movies, you didn't check to see what time the movie started, you just went. You could be there for the last five minutes of the movie, and sure. you sat there and you watched it. And then when the movie came on again, you would wait until that last five minutes to say, here's where the expression comes in that we still use today, this is where we came in. And you get up <laughs> and you would walk out. Yep. But Psycho, put in people's minds the idea of seeing something from the beginning and watching it to the end. Yeah, and and that to me, it's interesting because uh, there was, in, in my research, I had read in a couple of places that Hitchcock himself was a fan of Castle's work and it was the type of work that Castle was doing that inspired Hitchcock to make a film like Psycho in the first place. So it's interesting to me that you say when it's he made... Sort of come first, full circle then, yeah. It's interesting when you say Homicidal is a bit of him doing a riff on on a Hitchcock type movie, Psycho in particular. It's interesting how one imitates the other in, in like you say, in like a circular fashion. So, yeah, that's that's... William Castle. That's that's William Castle, the showman, the the inspired uh, puppet master, if you will, who who did these these wonderful uh, exhibitions of motion pictures that gave life to them beyond beyond what was on the wall. Um, did you have before we before we move on? Did, I wanted to ask: Did you bring any additional items with yeah, you? Yeah, I have one more. This is from the press conference that we had at the Chicago Theater. This was the 
one of the other things we got, an autographed photo of, of Mr. Castle, and we also got a one-sheet poster from for 13 Ghosts. Cool. Which I sold on eBay. But anyway. <laughs> Castle's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, uh, to jump back to something, Don, that you said uh, near the top of the conversation, he was especially uh, for a producer of his time, he was very much a personality. He was. And I, and I met his daughter a couple times, and I get the idea that he was really a good family man, too. Sure. Loved his kids. They loved him. He had a great sense of humor at home and everything. I mean, he's probably what you saw in those introductions when he's showing you how to work the, the punishment pole and all those things. <laughs> uh, that's probably the way he was. Yeah. And that's what he seemed to be every time I've talked. I talked to him. Yeah, there's a, like I said, I revisited The Tingler again pretty recently, and he comes out at the beginning of that movie much in the way that uh, the original Frankenstein film was introduced, with an on-screen, uh, a person issuing a warning that for some audiences this might be a little too terrifying. And it, it's Castle <laughs> himself doing this introduction, and he seems so warm and engaging and very like, okay, I like this guy. And he didn't take himself real seriously either. He's got the skeleton sitting in the chair next to him and all these kind of th little things he does, little bits of business. Those were great films, and I think most of his fans like the earlier, I don't want to say cheesier, but like the less prestigious ones, you know, not of the quality of Rosemary's Baby. They like those early films, House on Haunted Hill, um, The Tingler, uh, Homicidal. You know, in L.A. here, we have so many places like the Egyptian, UCLA Archive, all these different New Beverly screening houses, and... I have never heard of any of them doing a full-on William Castle retrospective. That would, How great would that be to see these films with an audience, especially if they could bring back a few of the gimmicks? Because I always telling people on our show, you know, please see these movies. Yeah. But to me, watching William Castle movies alone at home isn't the same. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you see these movies, invite a whole bunch of your friends to your house, get some beer and pizza or whatever, and... Have a little William Castle get party. Your, get your uh, airplane wing de-icers ready. Put them on eBay. eBay. You know, <laughs> put a towel over it or something. But it does just, they lend themselves, though, to audience participation. Yeah. Absolutely. They really do. Absolutely. And, and the Macabre, too. Macabre is kind of a boring movie. It's not really much of a horror picture. But I remember at the end, when you saw that doll made up to look like a decomposed baby, you'd never seen anything like that in a movie before. A, a decomposed corpse that looked like something out of an old EC horror comic book. It was, it was, it, that had a lot of impact. Sure. So uh, we're, uh, I don't want to run out of time, and Don, I wanted to ask you, since we have you here, a few questions about the work that you've done. Because I went, when, when I heard that we were going to get you on the show, I went, obviously, looked at your website, looked at your resume, and I went, what? Because I saw a lot of things that really that leapt out to me as things like things well, that are <laughs> fixtures in my in my childhood I, that you were a part of. I'm lucky. I, I have influenced a lot of people in the wrong way. I think because a lot of things I did that I thought was just <laughs> a job. Suddenly they're telling me that they had an epiphany or something, you know. And I feel horribly responsible for that. But um, yeah, I have done a lot of things. I've been a lot of. I was a musician. I was an actor. For I mean, my job, if you, if you have to put it on a resume, is avoiding getting a real job <laughs> so i i've been lucky i've been able to make my living over the years of doing things i like that no people would normally have as a ho i don't have any hobbies um all the things that would normally be considered a hobby are, are things i make my my livelihood uh, uh, from doing and i'm having a great time it's like being paid for for playing for having a good time sure and um I want to keep working until I drop dead. I want to die in the set between the words action and cut somewhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know I, I know exactly what you mean. There are there are a few things that jumped out to me that I did want to ask you about, and I apologize if there's some of the same things that you get asked about whenever you get asked questions. Yeah. Um, look, I, I'm a huge nerd, so the first thing that jumped out to me immediately was you wrote the novelization of The Empire Strikes Back. That's correct, yes. So I wanted to ask you, how did that come about, and what was what was that process like? It's a long... Uh, how much time do we have? Oh, we've got, I think, 10, 10 15. We, Basically, we the, the, oh, the, sure. the short answer is they just they asked me to do it, and I and I, they made me an offer, and, and I took it, you know. <laughs> um, I had been involved with some of the Star Wars stuff, the comic books and things, and I was going to be writing some of the newspaper strips. And uh, I had a, I have a friend named Craig Miller who uh, was working for Lucas Organization at the time, 
and he had a bunch of writer friends, myself included, and he was trying to get them one of the gi- one of them the gig to write the Empire Strikes Back, and brought in some samples, and they liked what they saw of mine. Said we we want you to stop all the other stuff um, that you're doing relating to Star Wars, and uh, we we like to take you to lunch. And you know, one thing when you're a freelancer, you never turn down a free lunch. Oh sure. And they took me to a Japanese restaurant uh, in Studio City and maybe an offer. It wasn't a great offer, but I looked at it more as a door opener. I mean, to this day, that movie is how many decades old already, and people still know what it is, so oh, yeah. I can use that as a sort of a uh, good thing on my resume. Well, it's it's, a, and it's, it's circled friend. back around against. I think Star Wars is about to be the biggest thing on the planet <laughs> again. Mm. So what was once once you had the the assignment writing this and you'd accepted the offer? What was that process like? Oh, it was a nightmare because uh, <laughs> I I was sworn to secrecy and they were like really you know if I would have told anybody what you know Luke was the son of Darth Vader and whatever, you knew that or well she, before anyone yeah, else did. Or, oh yeah, I knew that. Yeah, uh, sh- um, if I had told anybody the secrets of the script or whatever. Um, I, I could have gotten sued. Oh, sure. So um, I was so glad <laughs> yeah. to get that script out of my house when it was done. <laughs> and it was quick. I, I wrote three complete, dra- different, to- different from each other, three complete drafts of that book on a typewriter. Remember typewriters? They were like that, they were a ribbon in them. Um, in three, in six weeks. And the, the um, it, it, we were so under the wire, and it was done so fast that... Uh, it was due on a Monday. That Sunday night, I was in my office in my house writing, write, you know, no carbon papers or anything. That's another thing people don't remember, the carbon papers. <laughs> and the editor was sitting on my couch. I was married then, and my wife then was, I would, she would take the pages right out the typewriter and run them into the editor who would then do the, the editorial corrections. That's how fast it was. So, um, and everybody was, you know, paranoid about, paranoid about, letting any of the secrets out or what i'm not supposed to know that don't mention that character's name i'm not supposed to know it you know, sure all this kind of thing so i was really glad to get it off my back sure i can i can imagine that what do you off the top of your head do you know what was the release window like as far as its uh relation to the release of the movie came was out it? one week before one week before. which made me wonder to, to this day um why do people read novelizations because if you read it before the movie comes out, it spoils the movie. Yeah. If you read it after, well, you already know what's going to happen. And I, I, the, the director, that Irv Kirshner, I, I was at a party once, and he was there, and I said, you know, there's two versions of your movie. And he said, um, what do you mean? I said, well, there's the movie you directed, and there's the movie I saw in my head before I saw the movie, which then led me to think, um, because when I saw the movie, the first shot came on, and I said, oh, my God, it's different. Everybody who's read that book before they saw the movie created in their own imagination a different version oh yeah of, so there's like an infinite number of, of of versions of that movie or any movie that has a novelization that people read first yeah so it's a, it's a strange strange thing <laughs> um i also saw when i was looking at your resume uh my eyes as they often do drifted and locked on to the word comics on your resume and I saw some of the work that you've done uh, both for Marvel and DC Comics other publishers as well but it, the, the Marvel stuff leapt out to me first and there are, there are books on your resume that is Captain America Thor uh, What If The Invaders you, some, some Ghost Rider and I, I wanted to ask you how did you get involved with Marvel well I got involved with Marvel um, you know not what you know not who you know who knows you I got to, I was friends with Roy Thomas and when Roy Thomas took over Stan Lee's position as editor-in-chief, um, he gave me a break, and he, I got a lot of work through Roy. So, and then when Roy moved out here wanting to get in the movies, I got even more work because he he had to you know unload some of his, his, his commitments. Yeah, so are you, are you, because I'm just, I'm a huge, I'm like a huge Marvel fanboy. So are you, do you have a personal connection to any of these characters, these worlds, or is it just, yeah, this is, this is a job and I'm going to do a good well, job like I would for anything else? Job. Some of it was a job. Uh, but some of it, I mean, I was a big Captain America fan. So to be, to me, it was always thrilling to be able to take a character you grew up with and direct their lives, you know, and you know, uh, that was a, a thrill for me. Uh, it's funny when you mentioned uh, Egyptian theater uh, earlier today. Last night, uh, exactly the same time that I'm sitting here, uh, they ran a 19, uh, a Spider-Man 
amateur movie I made in 1969, and they ran it. And I gave a little talk at the beginning and everything. And um, so uh, a lot of these things come full circle. And I haven't really written comics in about 25 years, except recently. I got an offer. There's a magazine called The Creeps, which is kind of like creepy and eerie and vampirella, which is where I got my comic book start. And they wanted me to write some scripts. So I, my, the first issue just came out with my story in it. And I have another one coming out, I guess, in about a month or so, whenever the next issue comes out. And they like it. They're trying to bring back some of the old original artists and writers that work for the Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella magazines. And is that something that, that uh, our listeners, if they're interested, can pick up? Maybe your average brick-and-mortar comic shop? Yeah, I was in a, I was at a sh- sh- shop called Creature Features in Burbank last night, and they, they were... They had a big stack of them out there. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really so. Oh, you you mentioned uh, the 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 monster characters, and that segues me into the other thing that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, there are a number of uh, writing credits on your resume, both fiction and nonfiction, that pertain directly to the legendary big screen. Hollywood monsters, specifically the ones most associated with Universal Pictures, and one name that comes up quite a bit is Frankenstein. Correct. So. How what what is the what is the appeal of that world those characters Frankenstein specifically to you how did that come about and what what uh, what stories do you do you tell like what do you that's a really long story a, we really don't have time for that one today but I'm making a Frankenstein movie right now it's in production it's called Tales of Frankenstein it's an anthology with five stories. Uh, I have a book called Tales of Frankenstein also, which has about 25 short stories, all taking place in different places and different times and different descendants of Dr. Frankenstein and wannabes and all this. And I took five stories, and we shot the first segment about a month ago, and there's a wraparound with the original monster. And um, I've just got to come up with some money to shoot the next four. But sure. it, it, each one is in the style of the era that it's emulating. Uh, for instance, we have one that's set in 1931. Each All the years have some significance in Frankenstein history. And um, because of the color processes in those days, I'm going to pull the color out so it looks like the old two-color process. We have a film noir-ish one in 1948. I may pull the color out all together and do, do that in black and white. I have another one looks like a Hammer film. Another one looks like a Universal. So it's really going to be a fun project. But we have one segment shot and the wraparound. Is there a website where we can find out more about the project or a Kickstarter um, page? Not, or not yet. Um, uh, I'm, I'm waiting till we get at least another segment shot. And then I don't know. If I've been financing these myself. So uh, do I really want the next segment to be... I've never had any luck with Kickstarter or with Indiegogo or these things. Yeah. So uh, it, to me, it's always been a waste of time for me. I, I don't know how to promote them. Uh, I get a lot of likes and things on Facebook, but nobody sends me any money, you know. So I don't know if I'm just going to wait till I have the money to do the whole thing or maybe make a trailer out of the first two segments. It's, it's all very much up in the air right now. Okay. Um, well, there, there are a number of other works that you've done that I would love to pick your brain about. So we would love to have you back on at some point okay. in the future. Is there, is there anything else that you're working on now that you have coming up or something specific that you would like people to be aware of, something that, that well, you'd like to put eyes on? Well, I, I, I've got three movies. Uh, one is in post-production. It's a, a werewolf picture. Uh, one is a Frankenstein movie that's in production. And I'm also working on a... I can't say much about it. It's an animation f- feature, a big-budget animation feature. But also this creeps thing, and I think you might be able to relate to this. My first published story in 25 years is a horror story in The Creeps. It's called Nightmare in Nitrate, and it's about a, a guy who makes his living off taking old classic public domain movies and colorizing them and doing 3D trance, uh, t- turning them into 3D and whatever. And somebody, some unknown person, uh, leaves outside his door. Uh, the lost film that all the monster fans are trying have been wanting to see, which translates, it's in German. The German title translates as Berlin After Midnight. Oh, because it's riff on London it, After Midnight. And London After Midnight and Nosferatu sort of combined. And uh, it's, um, I really had a lot of fun with it. I didn't know if I could, could I write one after 25 years. It was like, you know, f- riding a bicycle or something. You just, you just fell right into it. And I really had a, a good time writing this story. It's got a lot of little in-jokes in it about film collecting and film collectors and fans and that kind of thing. Sure, that's fantastic. So if people want to find out a little bit more about you specifically, you have a website. Yeah, just my name, donaldfglute.com. 
Okay, and people can go there if they want to take a look at some of the things that you've done, learn a little bit more about you, because uh, listeners, I think it's become pretty clear already, this man is a fascinating career. It's worth using that as a jumping off point, learn everything you can about him. And like I said, uh, Don, we would love to have you back on. Absolutely. This was a treat. I'm so glad this worked out. This has been great. Thank you so much for being here. And that's actually, that's going to wrap us up for today. Thank you, Internet, for joining us for another edition of Historic Hollywood. Um, Carrie, where where can people find you on the internet? At Film Radar on Twitter or um, CemeteryTour.com. Okay. And uh, like I said at the top of the show, you can find me pretty much everywhere on all the webby, netty, talky, inter stuff. My handle everywhere is at the Lex Michael. We will see you next time. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good one. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.